Nihao, in this video we will extend the 4-bit unsigned multiplier previously made to now handle signed numbers. The main purpose of this is not to show you a new circuit, but instead to reason through how we can design circuits to accomplish a goal through the application of building block devices. So we want to perform sign multiplication. What does that look like? Let's use some numerical examples to try to pinpoint the procedure. What is positive two times positive three? That's just positive six. What about positive two times negative three? That's negative six. Similarly, negative two times positive three yields negative six. And finally, negative two times negative three gives us positive six. Simple enough. Now, what approach did you use in your head to compute those products? The approach that I used was to consider just the magnitudes of the input numbers. So when I saw negative three, I thought of it as positive three. Then I multiplied those magnitudes, which are two positive numbers. Then I took the product and decided whether or not to put a negative sign in front. How did I determine the final sign? We know from arithmetic that a positive product is the result of two positive inputs or two negative inputs. And a negative product occurs when just one of the inputs is negative. This pattern shown in the table will always hold. To this point in our design, we haven't considered gates or circuits. We simply reviewed something we already knew implicitly and tried to explicitly identify the steps. Now let's talk binary and logic circuits. First, as always, we must define the form of the numbers. Here, we will use inputs that are in 4-bit 2's complement form. Next, on the left side, I've written out the three steps of our procedure. Let's consider each one and how we might apply logic circuits we've already explored in past lessons. Think of these devices as tools in our tool belt. Consider just the magnitude of an input number means that we must negate any negative numbers and thus make them positive. Also, we must leave positive numbers as is. We have a device that can do this, the 4-bit negator with mode control. Recall that it uses one input signal to either negate the input or to apply no change. Next step is to multiply the magnitudes. In the previous lesson, we built an unsigned multiplier. That seems like the right tool for the job. Finally, if needed, the circuit must negate the product from the unsigned multiplier. Again, this can be accomplished with a negator with mode control. But it's a little fuzzy right now how we can determine the mode based on the input bits. Let's put a pin in that problem for now and see if the solution becomes clearer after we start laying out the circuit. This slide is our first attempt at the circuit. The box on the top right is simply a summary of the three steps in the procedure. Notice that the current layout features only devices we have built already. One negator for each of the inputs, one unsigned multiplier to compute the unsigned product, and then one final negator to determine the correct sign of the output. A good start, but each step in the design reveals more questions that we need to answer. First, what do we do about these floating inputs to the negators? How do we determine whether to negate or not? One option is to use a separate binary switch for each number, which means we must manually flip it to one to negate. Better is if there's some way to do this automatically. How would you do this? Consider what you know about sign binary numbers. In two's complement form, and really any sign binary form, we know that a leading one indicates a negative number. Therefore, the signal to negate or not can come straight from the leading bit of the input number. No need for a separate switch. Another big problem presents itself with this last device. The product will be eight bits, but our negator can only handle four bits. The fix to that is a simple one. Use an eight bit negator. I won't show the internal circuit for that, but you can refer back to the negate lesson and extend the pattern for the 4-bit negator.
over on the left side, we see the solution for deciding how to negate the inputs. This most significant bit doubles as the control signal. A 1 here indicates a negative number and also activates the negate operation, so the output will be positive. A 0 here indicates a positive number and deactivates the negate operation, so the output is still positive. There's one other big issue remaining. Can you find it? An easy way to spot a circuit issue is to look for the floating input pins. It is fine to have output pins that lead nowhere, but it's never okay to have a missing input signal on any device. We see one here on the negate 8. We need some type of signal that decides whether or not to negate the product at the end. How would you do this? Well, let's go back to our numerical examples. We saw this table that showed the sign of the output based on the signs of the inputs. Here, I convert that to a formal true table with ones and zeros. The positive signs are replaced by zeros because a leading zero indicates a positive number. Similarly, the negative signs are replaced by ones. What we see here is the true table for exclusive or. So, on the circuit, we can pass the sign bit of the input numbers into an exclusive OR gate and use its output to determine the operation of the final negator. Clever! We can read this logic as the final product will be negative if one and only one input is negative. Let's verify the accuracy of this example multiplication being shown. Recall that the numbers are in two's complement form and the inputs have 4 bits, while the output has 8 bits. This top A in binary is 1010. This bottom B in binary is 1011. Converting those to decimal yields, negative 6 times negative 5, which should equal positive 30. This output in binary is 00011110. The weights associated with those ones are 16, 8, 4, and 2. Adding those up yields positive 30. Good news! Obviously, for full verification, we should test all four cases of positive and negative inputs, but I'll spare you the time for now. Are there more efficient ways to build a sign multiplier? In terms of gate cost and propagation delay, yes. The circuit we just designed is a little cumbersome at the gate level. For perspective, each negator 4 holds 12 gates, and the unsigned multiplier holds 124 gates. Let's say you work for Intel, and your goal is to build a high-performance machine. In that case, you would not use this design. But is that really our goal here? No, our goal is to learn digital design. True learning does not come from seeing examples of the, quote, best designs and memorizing them. Better is observing and adapting various design processes. This lesson was an example of establishing a goal, reflecting on the approach we as humans would take to reach that goal, and then using modular circuits to replicate that approach. There is plenty of time later for optimization of very particular applications you may encounter in future jobs or research. On those jobs, you likely won't be developing anything new by copying canned designs. Creative solutions arise from connecting different ideas. So be willing to explore how and why different circuits operate and consider what problems could be solved with them. Lastly, take some joy in the process. It can be a lot of fun.